Hello and welcome to episode 88 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. Today it is coming to you from the last wet and humid days of June 2021. I was walking through London yesterday and it felt like I was back in Bogota, where I lived for three years before, before starting the job in the garden that I've been talking about in these podcasts. It felt hot and humid. It felt almost equatorial. And there was the similar soaked pavements. It rains all the time in Bogota, frequently coming down in, in street flooding torrents from the mountains and then clearing away to leave this, this hot, burning Andean sunshine. And all the paving stones are rocking because they don't really have enough cement under them. They're only glued down in a few corners, like, like some patios we've seen lame, which means that if you step on one corner, you drive the paving stone down into the puddle underneath and spray yourself with all of this street water. It is, it is the constant dance of Bogota life to, to scan the street looking for those telltale splash puddles and avoiding them. And I had a few of those in Camberwell as I walked through yesterday. It was quite a nice little reminder of, of things gone by. Over the last few weeks I've been on a sort of tour of the UK. I've been to Bristol and Pembrokeshire and Ramsgate and Hampshire and I've seen summer coming in waves across the island between the, the iris time and the rose time and now into that brilliant early dahlia unfurling. There were some magnificent moments. I really enjoyed going to Ashton Court up in Bristol which is a house owned, I think, by the council, which I know quite well. I once went to a big party there in a, in a tuxedo and dinner jacket, but I never seen the gardens, and they were really quite interesting. The front terrace has a formal lawn with double herbaceous borders on either side, well, well apart. You could play a game of football between the, the herbaceous borders. But the back of the herbaceous borders, instead of having a yew hedge, as you might in a lot of stately homes, there is this piece of incredibly gothic, looking stonework of domes, arches and dips which looks like someone has rearranged a load of gravestones. It looks like a piece of, of gardening landscaping from the same sort of aisle as that hardy tree in St Pancras Old Church. You know the tree that grows up from, from a pavement of, of gravestone tips as if they were a congregation all, all kneeling down around it. It's that kind of effect. And it looked magnificent there with all of these bright lupins, a plant of such life in front of them. So that was, that was very exciting to see. And then the rest of Bristol, I, I really enjoyed going around looking at the front gardens. There were some magnificent ones around St Andrew's Park. Down, down near the Gloucester Road. I saw some fantastic gardens all, all decked out in the most beautiful red honeysuckle, pure red, with lovely blue campanulas trickling over the walls below. Quite quite wild and woolly and slightly anarchist, as you would want, really, in a, in a Bristol garden. And then further up the hill, uh, towards Cottom, there was a most eccentric little Regency villa with roses that were sort of blood red, fairy tale blood, the kind of blood that you would see on a on a princess who's suffered a, a needle prick. And there was a cedar of Lebanon in that shaggy sort of forest creature phase of its life when it looks like some sort of mossy spirit of the woodland and a vast big mature smoke bush, those the Cotinus crogogria, the good green one with the pinkish candy gloss clouds, not not the purple leafed one. There is nothing like a walk around a city to remind a professional gardener that there are more combinations of plants than could be thought up by, by the entire design committee of, of Wisley Public Gardens, even if they were to sit at their, their sketchbooks until, until the world ended. And Ramsgate was a revelation as well, because they have that magnificent pulamite cascade going right down through the centre of the town, right down towards the marina. Huge, vast cliffs 
of this artificial stone put in in the late Victorian period. It must have been ruinously, ruinously expensive. How on earth they could justify it? Just before we set off, I was in South East London, where, where I live, and was remarking to, to anyone who'd listen how nice it was that on Denmark Hill they'd done some new planting in the flower beds and they'd stumped out for some lavender and santalina, which is a, a lovely combination, a classic combination. That's that grey leaf plant with the yellow buttons like you might find on a little hobbit's waistcoat. I was saying how nice it was that they had sprung for those and not just kept the grass that had been there before. And then you go down to Ramsgate and see that in the 1880s they said, damn it, we'll spend the entire council budget on, on the finest rock work that we can buy. And who cares if it costs as much as a children's hospital? I obviously wouldn't want any money diverted from essential services, but it would be nice to see that kind of ambition return to public planting again here. Who knows? Pembrokeshire was gorgeous and wild in its, in its Pembrokeshire ways. I was nosing around woodlands and wild flower meadows and sycamore woods crouching all thick-stemmed on the edge of the hill. My friend has just taken over a completely derelict piece of land up there with a ruined Georgian building behind blue shutters on the top of the hill overlooking Cardigan Bay. And the beauty of being a gardener is you get first invitations to these places. They say, we really want to see you and, and spend a bit of quality time with you. And then you get there and get handed a notepad and have to identify everything in the garden and give suggestions as to where you would lay out the decorative arches. And the reason that we were visiting all these places, I am excited and sorry to say, is that we were on something of a goodbye tour to the UK our lives are once more to be picked up, packed into their little Pickford's boxes and sent off across the sea. We are heading to Denmark, to Copenhagen, where we will be living in a little house a few minutes from the sea for the next four years. So the saddest part of the UK tour was the last farewell to the garden that has been my home and the subject of this podcast for the last four years. We said goodbye in the way that gardener clients and garden all deserved in a vast blaze of champagne, strawberries and sunshine. My little family came up and my assistant head gardener, who is now head gardener in his own right, took the afternoon off and we all got drunk on, on booze and, and the, the joy in what we had created. That was a couple of weeks ago now, so I'm not going to talk about what I did in the last week. Instead, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I have learned in that garden. So without further ado, let's get on with the years in gardening. Welcome to Four Years in Gardening, a bittersweet reflection on some of the things that the garden has taught me over the four years where I have had the honour to call myself its head gardener. I think the first thing is get things in quickly. We are always told that we should wait when planting a garden that we should give it a year to see what's there, to get to know the place and what it needs. And I think there is probably merit in that approach, certainly for a lot of people. But for me, I am beset by the knowledge that life is short and that no matter how much we appreciate that new mulberry we put in, we would appreciate it all the more if it were a year older. A garden thrives on a sense of establishment and that takes time. If you're planting a, a big plant or a little plant that you hope to become big, 
You need years for it to get going. A big plant will sulk, maybe for two years, in the third year start producing, and in the fourth year will be giving character to the place, its own special character, will be thrusting itself into the places where you never anticipated it going. And you don't see that in the first year, and you want to see it as quickly as possible. Maybe this is more true for professional gardeners than people who have found their lifetime garden, but we don't know how long our lifetimes are. I would always say, get the main things in quickly. Get the shrubs, get the roses and whatever else in fast. And if you decide in two years time you hate them, take them out. But you might well not. You might realise that your instincts were correct all along. It's also very useful because a garden, I think, takes three years to start giving back in terms of its plant material. This refers to herbaceous stuff primarily. If you put in a new planting plan full of trusty old faithful plants that you know you can split down the line, you want to give them a year to establish, a year to grow, another year to grow old, and then start breaking them apart and moving them around, and suddenly the garden has the momentum to carry itself forward, and you can start replicating it. It's almost as if it becomes a refracting sheet of water casting images of itself about, you have the ability to create little reflections of, of this border in that border and that bit over there because you have the same stock and that doesn't come quickly enough and it's infuriating to sit looking at these little sedums thinking if I'd put you in a year ago I could have you over here and here and here and here and now you must stay there confined not mixing like teenage guests at a disco we want the mingling please no shyness so straight into planting is my advice the second thing that I've learned is that it's all about the right people I talk a lot about the gardening work in this podcast and what I've done, or we have done, hopefully I say we occasionally, I should say what they have done because I actually do very little work compared to other people in the garden. The garden is carried by the the other people who work in it, mainly the, the amazing assistant head gardener who you might have heard me recruiting in one of the earlier episodes who has now gone on to be head gardener in his own right and who has done a fantastic job as a retraining entrant into the industry in teaching himself in evenings and weekends in an almost obsessive manner until he knows as much as I do and has a far better eye for for a job, a far better eye for doing things with care and consideration and finishing a job. So I have to say a huge thankful for, for being carried on the back of his work, but also the other people who help in the garden, the wonderful hedge and topiary man who has meant that the listeners have never really had to suffer too much of, of me talking about hedge cutting or keeping box pyramids in perfect Egyptian geometry. Uh, and also the also the, the Wednesday and Friday boys who come in for, for edging and soil thickening and, and that kind of stuff and the landscapers who are ever helpful in all their things and the machinery men and the and the tree surgeons and all the other people who, who keep a garden running. And if as a head gardener you can get those people right, then then there is a lot of time for, for sitting back and, and taking credit, which is awful, but I suppose that is the nature of, of human endeavour. Name me a workplace in which it doesn't happen in that manner. The third thing I've learnt is how fun it is to garden to your client's taste. I think gardeners are quite ready to criticise their clients. I don't know why. They decide what goes on, they pay the wages. If they want something doing, then you advise them, but ultimately you you end up doing it. And I have benefited immensely from working with plants and styles that I would not have naturally done were at my own garden. Were at my own garden, I would just have romantic sprays of roses and, and wafts, and I'd only go outside when there was when there was a dew and mist and romance all about but here it's been completely different and that has been wonderful i think that probably any half decent gardener 
can recreate their own personal Eden wherever they go. It's pretty easy. We all have our reliable herbaceous plants, our perfect shrubs, the, the right rose for that situation, the right evergreen. And we all know how to create a, a wafty blurring of the grass. But we're professionals. We should be able to cause intense delight in the heart of another not just ourselves. We shouldn't be battering people around into our way of thinking. We are circus performers looking to inspire delight in our audience. And that means we, we must read the room. What I've also learned from these particular clients is that it can be done. It can always be done. All of the incredibly, incredibly ridiculous ideas that have been suggested and come to fruition in the garden. The vast rocks swinging from cranes, the water fills built from the side of half-ruined buildings, all of these things I have been instinctively against with what I suspect is a quite common gardener's reticence. We are but simple folk and we like to know that something is going to work before we set out on it particularly because quite often things can lead to the death of a plant, which is sad. It's horribly sad for, for a gardener, particularly when it's a big, mature plant. And I certainly in this garden have crossed my arms and said, that's not really going to work. And generally speaking, it has. And if it hasn't worked, things have been salvaged from it. Which leads me on to a, a related point of sorts. And that's that there must be room in a garden for serendipity. And that can be the serendipitous arrival of the orchids into the meadow, or the serendipitous arrival of a load of massive wooden poles into the woodland garden. One of the nicest areas of the garden now was created as a storage space for these huge oak beams that occasionally get lugged to the front of the, the castle to create a, uh, a canopy terrace area. They needed somewhere to be stored upright, so we set them in sockets in the ground as giant great pillars, almost wooden monoliths, like something that, that Thomas Stuart Smith would make in beech, but they're in dark wood, set them upright and garden between them. And suddenly there was a height and energy and vigour to this little bit of woodland and a, a modernity to it that could not possibly have been created with all of the, the lovely Sissinghurst style geraniums and epimediums and erythroniums that I was scattering around. Finally, I'd just like to talk about some of the areas of the garden that I am most proud of. I was recruited for this position with an advert asking for someone to transform a garden from nice to magnificent. And actually, when I was thinking of this podcast, one of the alternative titles was going to be The Magnificence Project. I think that over the four years, the aim has largely been achieved. Though, of course, there, there is always a lot left to do in any garden. And I'm certain that even as I record this, the new powers are ripping out some of the awful things <laughs> that I've done and replacing them with things that I'm sure are going to be far, far better. One of the greatest things that we have done is putting in the meadow. And the meadow has been a case of slow magnificence. We had to hold firm particularly in the early years, had to hold firm against the influence of all of those wild flower verges sown from seed, all those people who sprayed and rotivated their land and had a brilliant field of poppies and cornflowers in the first year, all of those. But why does ours just look like long grass moments? And that was a victory in the end for the field geraniums, for the oxide daisies, for the knapweeds, for the vetches, for the orchids and for the primulas. We held out and said the flowers will come, we have to be strong. And we were strong. 
We started there, you might remember, very early in the days of this podcast, with Yellow Rattle and with vast sacks of daffodils. And the daffodils got added every year. Now it is a beautiful daffodil and camassia mead in the spring. I made a horrendous mistake. I remember boasting about it, I think, in those earlier podcasts, talking about how you didn't want to do the normal gardening advice. You didn't want to scatter the bulbs everywhere and then plant them. What you would do is trust your legs to randomness. Take a step, swing the pickaxe, plant a daffodil. Take a step, swing the pickaxe, plant a daffodil. In fact, there's a there's a picture of me, I think, from the early days on Instagram, I think I'm there as, as Gardener Dark, and you can see me with my pickaxe and my sack of daffodils striding around the meadow, apparently planting at random. Of course, when those daffodils came up, it became horribly clear that there is no randomness in the human leg. We are, we are meat computers. There is order to what we do. And what I've done is, is staggered about in quite predictable lines. So there are some snakes of daffodils through the meadow from that first year and other other patches and drifts and more Wordsworthian formations from later years. My great failure there was that I never quite got the Malvern Hills rose into the cherry tree in the corner of the orchard. I've been willing it on for four years, but it just didn't get enough water each year. The Malvern Hills rose in my garden, that's a repeat blooming rambler, has been magnificent this year. It's the same age, from the same batch as that one, but it has my attention. It is not miles from a house where water needs to be lugged in a bowser, and it has been nurtured, and now it flowers in great constellations across the, the back fence there in the ivy. It looks like a galaxy, particularly when it's getting dark. It looks like a galaxy of stars burning at different stages of their life. Uh, and I love it, and I never quite got it to reach the lowest branches in the orchard. It will do it, it will get there, it will get there, but probably not for another two years. Still making its way up, it's very, very long cane. I'm also incredibly proud of the fern glen we created with all of the tree ferns, even though this year it's been decimated by squirrels who have been digging in the fronds, I think looking for things that they think they've buried rather than to eat the thrones. But it's awful to see the croziers snapped off each morning. I think the problem there came when we chopped them down after that incredible cold spell. And that left a squirrel perch for them to sit atop, like, like a seagull on a masthead. And to dig and rootle around. We should have left the dry, dead old fronds on and kept them away at least. A lesson for the future and for any of you who are keeping tree ferns. It's taken time, but the ground in there is now a perfect carpet of dark heart's tongue ferns and that beautiful Azarum europaeum, the much, much superior form to that marbled Chinese cultivar. This is the pure green leafed form. We scatter primulas of various sorts through there in the spring and huge amounts of sweet woodruff, the Gallium odoratum, which is a perfect star-spangled ground cover. Which leads us on to the woodland gardens, uh, another joy, another area where things have been allowed to, to muck about and is now a sea of ephemeral plants. And finally, the rock gardens. Rock gardens are something that I would never have built under my own steam, but I have spent probably 50% of my time creating rock gardens of some sort with the diggers and trucks and wheelbarrows and soil. And it's been a joy. It's been wonderful to think of oneself as a terraformer, transforming a landscape rather than as a, as a decorator laying carpet. I really loved making crags and valleys and dips and, and rivulets. Not all of them have been appreciated, and I'm sure most people haven't even noticed that almost every rock garden now in the place has a geologically sensible origin story. You can see where a glacier might have travelled to, to carve this out. I've built miniature landscapes in the, in the Sir Frank Crisp style, as opposed to building close-ups 
of landscapes in in the Reginald Farrer style, but it has been it has been a joy in in every sense to work in this way. I've also managed to blur them, which is quite a achievement in a garden that is noted by everyone who visits for its incredibly high standard of maintenance, how well kept it is, how perfect the lawn is, how wonderfully edged everything is. But people overlook the fact that there's a huge amount of smudging and wildness and bits growing through gravels and plants erupting through what look like bits of the driveway. But because they're the right plant, they don't look like like an, an oversight. They look intentional and we've somehow got away with it. And the third area of which I am incredibly proud is the wet winter garden, a almost no maintenance zone of cornus and pittosporum, astrantia and ligularia zepta, with a huge flush of white camassia to start things off. It is an area that requires almost no maintenance. It looks after itself, though it is dark and shady and wet, a real plant killer, it works perfectly. And I think that's something that one finds after, after a certain amount of years in the, in the career, that, that anyone can do the sunny bed in front of the manor house and, and make it look lovely with the, with the crutch of the architecture behind it. But sometimes the greatest pleasure is in finding that awful problematic swathe and turning that into a feature, a destination. Anyway, enough of my accomplishments. Let's see what else I have got for you this week. No recommendations this week, though there will be plenty more of those in weeks to come. A big thank you, firstly, to all the listeners who I have engaged with over the past three and a half, four years. It has been a real pleasure to talk to you and to share with you the stories of this garden. A few people emailed me in this long hiatus and asked what the future of the podcast was very politely and I tended to reply with well I'm going abroad and I don't know if I should leave the garden log as a record as a testament to this garden and start another podcast or I should close this this chapter this season and reopen in the same place with the same audience to to see if they would follow me on the next stage of my horticultural adventure and luckily everyone said well that's silly we don't want to learn a new podcast address you just keep here so I'm going to keep here and I will be broadcasting hopefully slightly more frequently as I will have more time I won't have four hours of commuting a day plus a full-time job plus baby and and other duties to, to get on with so I may be able to talk about horticulture but it will be horticulture in a in a broader sense at first, as I find my way in the Danish plant world. I'm planning to start out by by volunteering over there in, in some of the the grander gardens, and hopefully I will find my feet and my own place in which to garden. There will be one final podcast coming out from the UK. We are flying on the 16th of July over to Denmark but there'll be one last podcast from the UK that might be recorded in Copenhagen which will be a a roundup of of London in the summertime. We are in a period where around every corner I find something that I want to tell you about. I've been doing a lot of work on front gardens recently, not working in them but work in terms of, of thinking work. I've been thinking a lot about front gardens Uh, for a project that I'll be able to talk about a little more later in the year. 
and I've somehow fallen deeper in love with the flowers and plants that, that I pass on the streets. And I think I was talking about in the in the Bristol part in the beginning of, of this episode. So I'll be broadcasting a little scene of, of late summer in South East London as a farewell to, to all this. As a goodbye, old chum, I'll see you again in, in half a decade. Luckily for us, this is not goodbye. This is just high high, as they say in Copenhagen. I'm really looking forward to talking to you all again from the, the edge of the Baltic Sea. Until then, I hope that you have a, a wonderful week or fortnight, whether you are in the garden or not, whether you are just passing through, looking at things as you go by. If you happen to have any connections to Danish gardening or to Danish gardeners, then I would love to hear about them. You can contact me on the Garden Log Podcast at gmail.com or you can find me on Facebook. There's a special group, the Garden Log Podcasts group. Again, I think there's a page as well, but go to the group and then you can then you can talk to me. And you can find me on Instagram. I think I'm Garden of Dark there. Anyway, get 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 hold of me in some way if you have any ideas about that, or if you want anything at all. I'm more than happy to give advice about plants and gardens and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And I will speak to you again in episode 89 of The Garden Log. Mm-hmm.